So for this week on Cyber School, we're going to be going over cyber data in Ring Central. We've covered a lot of the products and a lot of the specific things for the products. So now it's time to get into a little bit more applications and how to use the products. And since we do so much with Ring Central, I really figured that kind of the first of this series that we do on cyber data and other platforms would be Ring Central because we get so many questions either from um, customers that are looking to move to Ring Central that are existing cyber data customers or prospective cyber data customers that are kind of going through their migration to Ring Central or Office at hand. And I figured this would be a great place to not only get the education out for our own team, but for also anybody that would end up watching this video. So with that, let's talk a little bit about Ring Central. So Ring Central is, of course, a phone company that was started way back in 1999. Um, they weren't doing a whole lot in terms of VoIP back then. I mean, that was just kind of the early days of it. Um, but they were kind of doing a business phone system that was uh, kind of centric around um, Outlook and Windows. It was kind of specifically designed for that. Um, and then through the early 2000s and then into the 20 teens, they kind of uh, evolved into what Ring Central is today. So Ring Central is a hosted IP PBX and unified communication solution. So they're basically, you know, at the end of the day, they're a hosted phone provider that does more than phone. Um, they've got, you know, a huge market presence, arguably one of the bigger names in business phone systems. You know, pretty much everybody knows Ring Central. But I think I'm also a little biased because we work in the telecom industry. So, you know, I deal with Ring Central all the time, talk to people that use Ring Central. So I might be a little biased, but I mean, they really feel like they've got a huge market dominance. They're almost, you know, a market dominator um, just with their, their kind of name out there. Everybody that knows Business Voice has probably heard of or, or been asked if they want to use Ring Central. They're available worldwide in up to 40 countries so far, and they're always adding more. Um, it's always really fun to meet the different people from uh, Ring Central when we got to go to different trade shows. One of the last ones we met was they had just opened the Manila office in 2018. So we got to meet a lot of their team at some of their different events. Really good people with Ring Central. That's one of the things I really like about their platform is their people are all really personable from every level that I've spoken with. Either, you know, they're, they're kind of... Um, the general tech support people or their general sales people are really knowledgeable. And then all the, you know, the same thing goes all the way up where, you know, they're higher level techs at tech support, you know, they're higher solutions engineers and product managers are just good people. You know, they're, e they're really easy to work with, very personable, which is always something nice to look for when you're dealing with a company to work with on kind of a longstanding basis. But one other good thing, you know, it's all well and good to have, you know, okay, they're kind of a longstanding company, you know, they're in a whole bunch of different company in a whole bunch of different countries. They're good people. But Rick said, itself is pretty easy to use and pretty easy to set up in terms of a business voice system. You know, as compared to, say, doing something local, there's a lot less headache transitioning from, you know, a standard analog system over to Ring Central as compared to transitioning from an analog system to your own, you know, managed free PBX system. You'll encounter a lot more headaches going for something where you're going to try to control everything rather as kind of giving the keys to Ring Central and they slap a phone on your desk and send you a bill. So, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of good reasons to switch to Ring Central. So why would you want to use Ring Central? For one, they've got an awesome price point, especially for those small to medium business customers, you know, the people that are just looking for a couple different phones. You get a lot with Ring Central for the amount of money that you pay because it's not just a phone system, it's a fully unified communication platform. And that's kind of a buzzword that you hear a lot today when you're talking to different providers as you're going around and kind of shopping around for a different phone system. All, almost everybody's saying, "Oh, we've got a full unified communication platform." Well, what the heck does that mean? Well, that basically means that you've got not only your regular phone system, you know, you've got your desk phone, you know, when people still went to the office, that you could pick up and call, you know, uh, one of the neighbors in a couple cubicles over or call your customers and, you know, call anybody internally, you know, your regular phone system. But then it kind of evolved to being not only a phone system, but a chat system where you could have the Ring Central program, you know, either the Ring Central Classic like I run or their newer Glip version, or even a cell phone app. So that way you can not only get your calls on the go, but you can get all of your messages and teams um, and your groups. You can all communicate, you know, on the go where you've always got your smartphone in your pocket and you're able to communicate with somebody. So it really becomes more of a full communication platform instead of just a regular phone system. But with that, you also get a whole meeting system built into it. So, you know, you might not have your Zoom meeting, but you've got your Ring Central meetings. So, you know, you've got that full capability. So you've got, you know, the regular phone system that you would expect, a chat-based 
database system, a file sharing system, a mobile app, as well as a meetings app. So it really kind of covers everything that you would want out of a communication solution. It becomes a whole platform that you can really communicate with all your customers with. And again, really to hit on it, it's really easy to implement and manage where to get it working locally, you just need a, a pretty good internet connection depending on you know how many people are actually going to be using the system. You got to open up a couple network firewall ports and you're off and running. You know, then you get, you get the hardware from them and then you kind of have to have the fun of setting up your network um, for uh, doing both, you know, your regular data and your uh, and your your phone networking. So you know, there's a, a little bit of work to do um, to go and get everything set up. But the nice thing with Ring Central is their staff is just so knowledgeable about initial setup. Um, their teams are really good. Uh, pretty much anybody that you get with is pretty good at setting up the whole network. And another thing that's nice about it is it's extremely reliable. This is one thing that I can really hit on, um, you know, in terms of uh, actually helping cover support. You're really, I've really only heard problems with Ring Central once where people actually had trouble with the Ring Central servers. And that happened back with Hurricane Sandy a couple years ago where their main East Coast data center got taken down for about 18 hours um, with all that going on. And they had trouble switching all of the traffic from one data center to another. Apart Apart from that one problem years ago, I have never heard any problems actually have any customers actually have trouble with Ring Central. They're just such a reliable system. You know, as long as your internet's working, you'll be able to get your calls. So that's just a really nice thing for you know any kind of phone system that you're going to be using, especially with a hosted platform, is knowing that okay, you know, as long as I've got a network connection, I can get on to my phone system. Because if, if that's not the case, while well, you've got a really fast you know phone system, but your connection or your connection to the phone system isn't reliable, what good is that big fancy phone system that you got and of course since this is a cyber data you know a cyber data presentation here at cyber school it's going to be really important that cyber data products integrate easily it wouldn't be much of a conjoint presentation and talking about how great this platform is to use if our products didn't work well on it so when you're setting up cyber data products with ring central there's really two different extension types well there are two different extension types that can be used um, when somebody's setting up a device for ring central you've got either what they, what's commonly known as a digital line or a paid seat and a paging device so your digital line is uh, uh, think effectively like it's just another phone it just doesn't sit on your desk it's got all those same capabilities it's got the you know full duplex calling capability it can send dtmf it also technically has a voicemail you don't really need the voicemail but it has a voicemail you know it, expect that you can do anything out of a digital line but with that being able to do every anything you know have that full duplex conversation send dtmf tones um, you got to pay for that you know you're you're getting a full fledged service out of it so you do have to pay for that um, however using a paging device is totally free that's included with your account with ring central and you get 25 paging devices um, and these paging device extensions are kind of special where they're designed for one-way paging where audio can only go from the party that's calling, you know, one of those fancy uh, Poly or Yaling phones that you get from Ring Central, to the paging device that you're calling. A paging device cannot initiate a call, nor can it send any audio back to the calling party that fancy poly or Yalink phone that you picked up to make the page. So there are some limitations that are built in with that free paging device extension, but it's free. You know, you got to expect some kind of hindrances with a free system. Otherwise, you know, why, why would they even charge you? If everything's free, it might as well just be free. So when you're dealing with a paging device extension, of course, the biggest thing with a paging device extension is they're free. You get 25 per account, and there is a hard limit on paging device extensions per Ring Central account. You can't pay them, you know, a special fee or anything like that to bump it up to 50 or or anything. As far as I understand from talking to the different engineers, this is something that's hard coded into the account and cannot be changed even on their end, even on our end. We've got a special cyber data account to be able to do all of our testing internally and for our support guys to use. And we've got that hard limit of 25 paging devices per account. That's just one of those things that's set in stone that doesn't change. But these designs are really, uh, these extensions are really, again, designed for one-way paging, where you want to be able to just pick up a phone and make an overhead announcement, whether that's through IP speakers, um, an IP to analog style device, or even a combination. You know, it's really designed for that one-way paging announcement. You know, you need to let somebody know that, hey, there's a package for them up front, 
or hey, it's break time, or you know, you need to do the morning announcements or something like that. Um, but as long as it's a one-way page, um, there any device that that can do that would be absolutely perfect for it. So then, after you've got all these different paging devices created, you can create different groups to put these different paging devices in. Instead of having to say, call a whole bunch of speakers individually to make that announcement, so you've got four speakers in a cafeteria, wouldn't really be realistic to call each individual speaker and make that same announcement so the people in the cafeteria can barely hear that announcement and the people that can have to hear it like four times. It'd make more sense to call a group of speakers so that way all of those speakers can chime in together and play that same announcement. And that's that same capability that you get from these paging groups. And these paging groups are, of course, dialable, dialable by any Ring Central phone. Of course, there is some privileging stuff uh, that you have to go in when you actually set up these groups. You have to set up who can actually call these groups. So that way you have a good way to limit it, especially, say, in a school scenario. You probably wouldn't want uh, the general all-page school announcement to be able to meet, be made from any office, you know, any, say, classroom. It'd probably have to be made from the, the front office so you don't, you don't get some high school hooligan uh, playing pranks on everybody. Um, but once you get all the devices set up into a group, they're really easy to use, and any device um, that's Ring Central enabled can make that announce it can make an announcement to that group, again, assuming that they're allowed to do that. And these can be anything from the standard desk phones that you would get from Ring Central, so your Poly or your Yanglink phones, as well as the Ring Central app on your smartphone, either Android or iOS, as well as the Ring Central Classic or the Ring, the Ring Central Glip program that you can actually run on your PC or Mac device. Um, so you've got a lot of different capability to actually make these paging announcements depending on how you're using Ring Central. And the nice thing is, is since everything's tied to your account, you can make these announcements from anywhere in the world. You could be working from home like a lot of us are now and still make that announcement into the factory as long as you're doing it through either your Ring Central phone, your app, or the program running on your computer. So you've got a lot of capability. You've got a lot of capability to do that. But again, the couple things to hit on these um, paging device extensions is they, they are not without limitations. They do definitely have limitations. The two biggest ones are audio can only go from the phone to the paging device. It is not possible based on the way that the, dev that the extension is set up for the device that's receiving the page, in this instance the paging device, to actually send any audio back to the caller. So if you're dealing with a problem, say like you get on a lot of cyber data products where we'll have a prompt to enter, say, a two-digit zone code or press zero to page or press one through nine for stored messages, you won't be able to hear that prompt because it can't transmit audio back to the caller, nor, with our other limitation here, can DTMF be sent to the paging device to actually select one of those groups. So you're not at some kind of thing where, okay, the audio can't get back from the paging device, but I can still send DTMF to toggle the group. No, you can't do that. Only audio can go from the calling phone to the paging device. So if you've got any prompt to deal with to select through, say to press zero to page, you cannot do that with a paging device extension. So that is one of the hard limitations that you get with it and one of the reasons to opt for the standard digital line extension. So what kind of products should be used as a paging device? Well, again, really, since they're designed as a one-way paging device, anything that would be used in a one-way paging scenario. So you could say, for example, our standard SIP speaker, our IP66 outdoor horn, our paging amp, our loudspeaker amplifiers in either option, with or without PoE power, um, the uh, SIP office ringer, the paging adapter and the paging server are great products to use as a standard paging devices. However, with all of these devices, you can get more features out of them if you pay if you opt for that digital line. So with that, let's talk a little bit more about digital lines. So these digital lines are of course full extensions. They're completely paid extensions. They do charge, you know, the the regular fee uh, based on what particular size of account that you have, 
Um, but with that, you get the full capability, you know, essentially equivalent to a standard phone. It's just not sitting on your desk. The way that I always describe a lot of the products at Cyberdata that would need this type of an extension is it is a phone. It just, it's either in your wall, like it's an intercom or it's in your ceiling because it's a speaker. It's a phone. It's just not the common idea that we would have as say a regular desktop phone because it functions a little bit differently. But at the end of the day, in terms of the functions with Ring Central, they're going to be exactly the same. So some of the things that you get with a digital line extension is you get that full duplex or two-way communication where two parties can talk to each other just like you'd expect in a regular phone call. You can also pass DTMF um, to the devices that, are rece that uh, receive the call. So that way in that same example from when we were talking about a paging device and you get one of those prompts to say press zero to page or press one through nine for stored messages, you can do that. You can, you, you can take advantage of the stored message feature set of a lot of our products. Or with, say, our paging server, you can use the 100 different multicast paging groups that you have with the box that you would not be able to use with a regular paging style extension. You also get a voicemail, and then you can make and receive calls. So this type of extension is really useful for anything that can um, be used as a call originator. You can press a button and have the device actually make a call. Um, and in the instance of where you would want a voicemail, I don't know why you would, but you could, you can have a voicemail. So what products should you use as a digital line? And that would really be any of our intercoms. Um, there really wouldn't be any sense that you would use an intercom as a standard uh, paging device because it's not really designed for that. And the way that our extensions operate internally on the device, it won't work properly. Um, so anytime that you're trying to set up an intercom, you do want that to be a full digital line. Because at the end of the day, you're getting an intercom. So somebody that's walking up to the building can press the button and talk to somebody inside. You know, that's the reason that you have an intercom. It's not for one-way announcements for a phone to the intercom. You actually want somebody to be able to call from the intercom, especially in today's, uh, you know, COVID life where you have to, you know, confirm somebody to, somebody's identity and then, you know, do a temperature check before you let them in, you know. So that's, that's one of the reasons that a digital line is just so important for the intercom. So that way you can take full advantage of what the intercom can do. Another great example would be our talkback speakers. Um, a lot of our speakers are available in both a one-way or a talkback um, scenario where you can actually have a full duplex conversation with our talkback speaker. Um, so that way, of course, if you want to be able to do that, you want you don't just want to use the talkback speaker for one-way paging and you want to use it for that full talkback capability, you can do that if you opt for a digital line. And if you also have the remote call button uh, you can actually press that to initiate a call from the TalkBack speaker. So you get a lot of capability when you're dealing with um, the TalkBack speakers if you set it up as a digital line. They also support the stored message feature. So that way, if you're making that one-way that one way announcement through the TalkBack speaker, you can still play those stored messages. So you get a lot of capability, um, especially with just our standard speaker, if you opt for a digital line. Another product that really kind of has to have a digital line would be our VoIP industrial phones. We got a whole we have a whole bunch of phones that fit into this particular category. Um, things like a ring down phone or our emergency keypad. Um, we've got a lot of different options for that, but because those are designed as full duplex two-way communication devices, essentially just a different style of an intercom. You know, some of them actually have a handset that you can pick up and talk to somebody with. Those ones really need a digital line and they won't work properly if you just assign them a paging style device, again, because they're not a one-way paging device. And then we've also got the SIP paging adapter and the SIP paging server listed here. And those are two products that kind of fall into a gray area where they're, they can both be used as both a paging device as well as a digital line. And you get a lot of capabilities for moving them towards the digital line, but they'll also work as a standard paging device. And the differentiation point and the point that'll help you decide if you need a digital line or you can stick with just the standard paging device is the capability that you need out of the paging adapter or the paging server in this given instance. 
So say, for example, you've got a paging server and a whole bunch of IP66 horns, and you want to be able to do paging not only in your warehouse, but you want to be able to do paging outside. You know, the guys have a big parking lot, and they go and hang out in, and you need to be able to make those, that you need to be able to make those announcements. So with the paging server, you could, of course, do that through Ring Central using the paging groups feature. You've got 25 paging devices you can use, but say you've got 26 paging devices. Say you've got one over. Then how do you interface with everybody? Well, at that point, you can you, you can move anything over to the paging server, and instead of having different groups um, that would be handled through Ring Central, everything can be handled by the paging server because it supports 100 different multicast paging groups. So you can have up to 100 different multicast paging groups through the paging server, and that way you can toggle all of those through the digital line capability of the paging server. So that would then translate how you would use the paging system from pressing the nice little paging key or dialing star 84 on any of your Ring Central phones to just calling the extension number of the paging server and then selecting one of those particular paging groups. So you get a lot more capability out of that. And the same thing kind of goes for the paging adapter. Although the paging adapter has different reasoning as to why you would want one of these um, fancy digital lines. You can, of course, use that stored message playback capability where you can press zero to page or press one through nine for stored messages. You get a little bit to do with that. But the, I think the bigger reason why somebody would want a digital line for the paging adapter is DTMF pass through to select an analog zone. So the main differentiation point between the paging adapter and the paging, paging server, of course, since they have the same hardware, but different software, is that the paging adapter is designed specifically to interface with an analog amplifier, whether that's a single zone analog amplifier or a multi-zone analog amplifier. The paging server can do the same thing necessarily, but it's not designed uh, like the paging adapter is with those connections at mind. It's adapted to rather than designed for, if that makes sense. So with the paging adapter, you get the capability to add an additional DTMF menu to enter a, um, a DTMF code to toggle an analog zone. And that's one of the reasons that a digital line would be important because the it depends on how these zones are, are handled and actually created. If the zones are more IP based, say for example, through the paging server, that can be done all with multicast groups. Or for example, with the ring central paging groups, it can be handled in that manner as well. But if you've got say a smarter amplifier that you could encounter in some larger factories or office buildings or schools, um, they'll typically have an amplifier that's smart and can detect DTMF and pick a particular zone. So the main differentiation point you want to pick when you're dealing with the paging server or paging adapter and if you should get a digital line or not is if you need to send DTMF to the device to either select a, an analog zone in the world of a paging adapter or an IP zone in the sense of a paging server. If you don't need to do either of those, meaning you're fine with a single zone page, just pick up a phone and make an announcement through all of the speakers, you can go with a standard digital line option. But if you need that selection, again, that selection either being a hardware-based analog zone through the paging adapter or an IP-based through multicast using the paging server. And that's kind of how you decide whether or not you want a digital line or a uh, paging device. So let's talk a little bit more about the differences between the two. We kind of did just hit on this, but I want to re really reiterate, this is a really common question that we get from a lot of different customers. So I wanted to spend, uh, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this. And again, the biggest thing to think of when you're kind of going through and making this decision is what are the expectations of this device? What do you expect this thing to do and what do you want it to do? If you're just looking for something, again, that can do only single zone paging, you pick up a phone and you make that general overhead announcement, or you're basically doing the same thing that IP based, where you've just got that one zone and instead of it being all analog speakers, you've got our fancy IP66 horns, you can do all of that with a paging device. Um, basically anytime that you need to make those one-way announcements, either through a single zone that's either analog or IP based, you're pretty much fine with a paging device. However, if you need to do some kind of either um, full duplex 
uh, style of communication. You know, you need an intercom or you've got a talkback speaker and you need that full capability to be able to have a two-way conversation. You need that DTMF selection for that uh, IP-based zone, for that multicast zone, or you need that DTMF selection, but for an analog paging zone, um, that you'd really want a digital line for that. Again, at the end of the day, the biggest way to come to this decision is to understand and, and really come to grips with what is expected of the uh, cyber data device. What do you expect this thing to do? And what, do you, what are the objectives to be accomplished with the paging system? And once you have all that accomplished and understood, it's really easy to pick between a paging device or a digital line. So to set up everything on Ring Central, now that we've kind of covered why you would want Ring Central, how our pro how our products integrate together, and then how to pick the two different options, you have to set up the devices for Ring Central. Thankfully, we have a lot of documentation to set up our products on Ring Central. Of the different platforms that we have out there, I actually use Ring Central as kind of the model when I'm creating other documentation for other platforms because I think we've done it so well with the guides for Ring Central where we've got individual guides for Ring Central for all of the products um, that walk through the setup process for not only doing everything on the Ring Central side, but also on the cyber data side. So that way you can take one of these guides and get somebody into the web interface of both our device and Ring Central and have them set up one of the products. It's really designed from the ground up to be easier than programming a time on a VCR. Um, so with that, to just kind of go over how the general setup works on Ring Central, you pretty much only work with a primary SIP server, um, where you'll see in other instances and other platforms where there'll be both a primary and backup servers used. When you're dealing with Ring Central, everything's just sent to the primary SIP server, and the backup servers are handled differently through the Ring Central system. So then you need a particular outbound proxy and port. And there's two main um, outbound proxies that, that they'll use here in the States. There's plenty across the world, but in the States here we use SIP10 or SIP20.ringcentral.com. The only things that change again are that SIP and then the number. It would be either 20 or 10. And the difference between those is just the geographical location of that particular data center, either on the West Coast or the East Coast. So it makes it pretty easy to understand um, just seeing that outbound proxy where the particular end customer is located. But then we've also got the outbound proxy port. Ring Central doesn't use the standard um, 5060 port UDP port that would be used by just about everything for SIP traffic. They opt to use outbound proxy port 5090, um, which is actually pretty standard, not to say that port, but changing the port in general, that's usually a pretty good practice by a lot of hosted providers just because in the documents that set out the standards for SIP, Everything is supposed to use port 5060 for regular UDP or TCP connections, and then port 5061 for TLS connections. So it's usually good practice when you're hosting anything on the open internet, like Ring Central, to use a different port. So that's just the, the security aspect of Ring Central in mind, even from the, the port that you used to connect with it, they decided to use a different one just for that extra level of security. Again, it's pretty standard, so it's not too much security, but it's security nonetheless. The other things that are really important to change when somebody's registering to Ring Central, there's two particular settings. The most important of which, which I have made bold here on our left hand side, is our keep alive period. By default, our keep alive period is set to 10,000. And this particular setting is measured in milliseconds. So a setting of 10,000 is equivalent to 10 seconds. And basically what the Keep Alive period does is every 10 seconds with our default configuration, it will send an empty message either to the primary SIP server or the outbound proxy. And the outbound proxy takes precedent when um, any, any traffic is actually being sent. If an outbound proxy is configured, all of the traffic will go to the outbound proxy and not the server. But when you're playing with a hosted provider, unwanted traffic is generally not taken well by the provider that you're connecting to because that can be seen as what's known as a DDoS attack, a dedicated denial of service attack, where basically devices will just spam different addresses with you know, service requests so that way it gums up the whole server and nobody that's actually trying to use it can use it. So what our Keep Alive period does again is it sends a, basically an empty message every 10 seconds to the, in Ring Central's case, the outbound proxy. And this was designed to help keep um, network switches and network ports that we were connected to open. 
Um, so that way the ports wouldn't shut down. There was a big thing that a lot of the switch manufacturers were doing in the late uh, in the late 2000s and early 20 teens, where all of their switches would use green mode by default. Where if a sw a particular switch port, where you've got your PoE device plugged into, was experiencing low amounts of traffic, you know, it's kind of the end of the day. The switch would decide, hey, there's not much traffic going on. I'm going to give the minimum amount of power to just keep this device on because I'm going to save power. Well, a lot of hardware, CyberData included, had trouble actually waking up that particular port from that essentially sleep mode that the green mode put it into. So we came up with our keep alive period to send a message every 10 seconds. And that worked fine for years because it's an empty message and it doesn't really do much. But with so many different providers moving to a hosted system now where they're concerned about these DDoS attacks, these de dedicated denial of service attacks, any potential device that's sending, you know, basically useless traffic um, will get noticed and put on a blacklist. So this is a really common problem that we get from a lot of customers when they're doing the first implementation with Ring Central is they'll call up and say, hey, our device works for about five minutes and then stops. And then it comes back after like five minutes and it'll work for a couple minutes and then stops. And this just keeps repeating. What's going on? I think it's broken. Send me another one. Uh, where in reality, it's because they didn't disable the keep alive period. Um, so that's one of the major problems that we have with I wouldn't say a problem, but it's one of our, our settings that can actually cause an issue if it's not properly disabled. But the keep life period is also kind of important just to be able to make sure that we've got that good connection there, which is why we recommend setting a re-registration interval to 30 seconds. This isn't necessary because the way that the registration interval works and all the registration interval is how often the device will check with the server to say, hey, I still want to use this particular phone number or this extension number. And the server will say, yes, you can still use that extension number and you can use it for the registration interval. So what we do is we recommend sending our registration interval to 30 seconds, which will have us re-register after about 23 or 24 seconds. So that way, and this is all accepted traffic by the system, we can keep up almost that keep alive period but done in a different manner to keep all of those ports open and keep everything happy and right as rain, and it doesn't bother the server and have the server shut us down. So those are two recommended settings that we always recommend when somebody's when somebody's setting up our price our products on Ring Central, changing both the keep alive period as well as the registration interval. I couldn't tell you how many calls we get a day in tech support about this one particular problem. Um, so that's one of the reasons I really wanted to to kind of reiterate on that and go through that a lot. But we've got one other setting that we usually recommend when people are using Ring Central, and that's to change the codec that's used during a regular phone call. Without getting too nitty gritty and into the weeds about what a codec is, a codec is essentially the language that the two devices will speak when they're talking to each other. And the two devices in this case would be your cyber data device and whatever would receive the call. So that could be, say, your Yealink phone, your Poly phone, could be your smartphone, it could be your PC, basically anywhere where you get these Ring Central calls. They basically speak in different languages, which are these codecs. And that all that is, is it's just a way to encode the audio that's being sent from point A to point B. Um, we always recommend using PCMU G711 ULA as it works really good on our devices, doesn't cause too much traffic bandwidth, and just generally sounds good um, acro across, the, across the board. It's not a, a required change per se, but it is something that we recommend because just given our ears, and this is really a subjective test, it sounds better as compared to the other options. Not meaning that the other options sound bad, this just seems like the most pleasing and the best sounding option in comparison to say uh, G722 or G729. This just seems to be the best sounding option, which is why we always recommend it. So to set up the paging groups on Ring Central, of course, um, you, need, you do need to set up all of the individual paging devices beforehand. So that would be your um, cyber data paging speaker, your IP66 horn, anything like that. Um, but after you get all that set up, you want to set up these different paging groups. And these groups are, are just groups of paging devices. They are paging only groups. It's 
pretty simple. Um, so once you go and you set up these different groups, it's always recommended to set these groups as not only um, you know particular areas that you need them to be, but you've got the uh, capability to name these different groups. And these names aren't really relevant to say, uh, you know, you can go through an auto attendant and say, I want to make a page to the factory, or I want to make a page to outside only. They're more for your assistance in the future as you go and you're troubleshooting something, you know, a year down the line. Oh, what the heck did page and group three actually go to? Well, if you took the due diligence and time to name that page and group three was the west end of the factory, you would know exclusively what particular devices to go and troubleshoot if you're having trouble with that area. So it's always recommended to name your groups accordingly for what devices will be interfaced by that particular group. Just do that due diligence early so that way it helps your future self. But after you get those groups set up, you do need to set the devices that can actually um, not only receive the page, but send the page. And the, the devices that can receive the page, it can be a single device, it can be many devices, but it's always going to be these um, paging only devices. So any of the, basically, uh, it'll be a different combination of those 25 paging devices that you get to have on a particular account. After you get all that set up, then you need to set the phones that can actually call a particular page group. The nice thing is this is selectable per page group, so you can have some page groups that more, peop that more people can page to and others that are more restricted. So that way you can have that fine granularity to say, okay, almost anybody can page to, you know, say the science building, but if somebody wants to make a general all school page, it can only be done in the front office. Um, just so that way you can really restrict and kind of limit who can make those pages to prevent um, unnecessary or uh, unsolicited messages. Uh, because kids will be kids. Teenagers will be teenagers if you give them the chance to be. So now that we've kind of covered how to actually set up these groups and what these groups involve, how the heck do you actually call one of these things? So there's really two different ways to go about it. We'll illustrate really the um, the dialing option here, but it's very the, it's very similar with our other option that we'll touch on in a moment. But what you'll do is you'll pick up any phone, of course, that's allowed to page to a particular group, and you'll dial star 84. And that'll get you an auto attendant that'll say, please enter your paging group number followed by pound. So our example would be to page to group 123, you would dial star 84123 pound. And then you'd be able to make that announcement to whatever group 123 corresponds to. So that's one way to be able to make a page. The other option and the other the one that I find most Ring Central customers end up using, especially just because they get polyphones, um, when the device is actually provisioned by Ring Central, when you initially get it set up and you know, you can start sledding your splash screen and all that cool stuff. You get a nice little um, soft key that's sitting there where you can press a physical button to toggle the paging group. And basically what that does is it dials star 84 for you. So then you can either press the paging group and then you get that nice little auto attendant that'll tell you to enter your paging group number followed by pound, or you can dial star 84. Um, so those are really the two ways to actually interface with the paging groups. And then the dialing method, of course, would be exactly the same for any standard desk phone, any Ring Central soft client, either on your phone or on your PC, um, to be able to interface with it. It's pretty much the same across the board. So to set up a digital line, the process is basically like setting up any other regular desk phone. There's a really nice walkthrough that Ring Central has where it walks through all the different necessary steps where you pick the particular location that the device is going to be in, the emergency E911 number um, that should be called and where that device is located. That's all kind of necessary. Then you pick a proper phone number that it can use. And then, of course, you get your credit card out and you pay. Um, but that's probably already tied into your account number, so you probably wouldn't need your credit card. Um, but once you get all that process set up, it, it's pretty easy to set up um, the device itself where it would use the same format that we covered in the last page, where you basically get a nice little pop-up at the end of it where it says, you know, okay, primary SIP server, and you take the information from primary SIP server and you put it in the primary SIP server, and so on and so forth for all the additional settings that you'll go through and set up. Um, and then you'll want to go and limit the extension accordingly uh, through the actual Ring Central system. And these limitations will be, you know, things like only calling internally, only being able to make calls in certain hours, depending on the application and depending on what the particular device is doing. 
of course, you know, say if you've got an outdoor intercom that's, you know, uh, right by the outdoor sidewalk, you know, say like outside of a school and it's an intercom that uh, parents can use to talk to the office staff inside, you know, something that really anybody could walk up to and press the button, even not in school hours, you probably wouldn't want to have it do anything in uh, off hours. Um, even if it is just calling the phones internally, because there are some smart hackers out there and they can hijack that and potentially do toll fraud through your system. So it's really recommended to, to do your due diligence and limit the extensions accordingly based on the potential risk. Of course, again, an intercom that's exposed to the public is going to have more risk than, say, a talkback speaker that's in a classroom, that's in a locked classroom behind a locked gated facility. That one's going to be a little bit less risk and might not need to be as limited as, again, that intercom that would be exposed to the public. So that's always good things that you can do um, when you're setting up something uh, on the Ring Central side. But there's also some adjustments that you can make on the CyberData product, and really that is just to opt into the particular features that you want to use. So say for an intercom, you would want to set up the DTMF relay control, depending on what you're going to interface to. And if you're using any of our accessory products, say the intermediate door strike relay or the dual door strike relay, Basically, you just want to set up the particular features that would be necessary based on your application. So if you're going to be dealing with, say, a paging server, you'd want to get all those different page groups set up and all those multicast groups set up. Or a paging adapter and the stored message capability, you would want to get all those stored messages loaded in there and the stored message feature opted into. Um, See, so, you know, that's that's really all of the configuration side that would need to be done on the cyber data side. There's very little difference in terms of the direct configuration on a cyber data device when talking about a digital line versus a uh, paging device extension. They're very, very similar and they're different in very minute details that are really only relevant to the particular implemented use case. So at the end of the day, should I use Ring Central? Well, it's got an awesome price point and it's really feature packed. I mean, of the platforms out there, I think most people are trying to catch up to Ring Central and adding all of the different features that Ring Central has. They do a lot in the market and they really can be seen as a market leader. I don't want to be, you know, too uh, too Ring Central enthusiastic here because we are going to do other providers down the line, but I do think Ring Central has one of the better offerings out there because it's such a great mix of price point, features and reliability, which are just three important three things that would be important to me if I was picking a phone system. And the one kind of dig that I have for Ring Central is I always try to come up with one kind of dig, one kind of thing that could always be improved is their limited support for H.264 video. Um, that is one thing that we see with a lot of hosted providers. It's not uncommon for most hosted providers to not support H.264 video because that's such a commodity um, in this industry where most a lot of people would think, oh, yeah, I want a video call to be able to talk to somebody. But in practice, it's not what a lot of customers want just because it can be so expensive to actually implement an intercom and then the phones that support video or you need the dedicated soft phones that can support it. It can really bloat up the cost there and it really just ends up becoming one of those luxuries where it's not completely necessary for a phone system to be able to see somebody when you talk to them. Um, so that is one thing that is kind of a, a limitation to Ring Central. There is, you know, uh, uh, hammering and hollering, you know, uh, some some quietness that I hear, some whispers that they're talking about doing. So they're talking about supporting H.264 video. It could happen, um, but right now it's currently only supported between a couple versions of polyphones and, of course, in a meeting. Um, so it is kind of limited right now. They might change that in the future, but for the time being, they don't support H.264 video. And one thing that I like to do in terms of cyber schools where we get kind of into the nitty gritty of different terms and things that we don't normally talk about as we go through these different sessions, um, I wanted to just have a couple terms that I wanted to define a little bit more. So IP, PBX, this is a term that you'll hear tossed around a little bit. It's not too common today, but you'll still hear it sometimes. And this stands for Internet Protocol Public Branch Exchange. So you get kind of the merger of the IP devices, so things like your computer, your smartphone, your VoIP phone, IP, and public branch exchange, which is how most phone systems have always been called. They've been called public branch exchanges. But in the terms of today, when you combine these two IP, PBX, it's basically just a VoIP phone system. There are some subtle differences between them, but at the end of the day, it's a VoIP phone system. 
Unified communications is another term that we covered today. And really, whenever you hear this buzzword, and it's really a buzzword, um, just think it's more than a phone system. It's got chat, it's got meetings, it's got a mobile app, it's got all the other stuff in addition to being able to pick up a phone and call somebody. The next term that we went over is DTMF, and we use this one quite a bit. And this one is dual tone multi-frequency. Um, and basically all that is, is it's two different tones that get mixed together and played when you press a button on a phone keypad. Um, just those kind of different uh, beeps and, yeah, beeps that you hear when you press a button. Um, this used to be really useful back in the old phone freaking days, you know, back, you know, before I was even a twinkle in my old man's eye, uh, you know, you used to be able to get uh, different, you know, uh, whistles and stuff out of a box of Cracker Jack and be able to make collect calls for free. Um, you can't really do that now, but uh, that's kind of where all this came from. It was a way to be able to determine what buttons were actually pressed on a particular phone. Next, we get to full duplex. This one's fairly easy to understand, but it's mainly used in conversational and especially in telecom, in conversational circumstances and in telecom, where full duplex literally just means that you're having a full two-way conversation. Um, you're having a full duplex conversation, whereas a half duplex would be, say, one party talking and then the other party talking, kind of like think a walkie-talkie, um, or even, say, like a box style scenario could be considered a half duplex option. But a full duplex is, you know, like what you would expect out of a phone call, where you talk and somebody else can talk or even talk over you. And finally, we get H.264, um, and this is used in the context of video. And all H.264 is, is it's um, an AVC, it's an advanced uh, video coding. Uh, basically, it's just a format of video. There's a whole bunch of different formats for video out there, but when you're dealing with stuff exclusively for VoIP, it's almost always H.264 video. Thank you for watching this edition of CyberSchool. If you have any questions, please get in contact with our sales department. They're available by email at sales at cyberdata.net or by phone at 831-373-2601 extension 334. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe for more content like this from Cyberdata.